Welcome everyone. Um, we have prepared uh, the slides to share with this URL and also the collaborative notes. We'll wait for two minutes for the people to arrive and, and join um, our session. Thanks for having. Thanks for coming. If anyone joins the session later, please help them by taking notes in, in the collaborative document. We have different sections where you can see you have not the time to look at them. We have a participants list. We have an icebreaker um, section. Then we have notes and questions for you. And then at the end of the session, we will prompt you to take some takeaways from, from today. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, welcome to this session for the Fair for Research software. Um, we are a group, working group at RDA uh, Research Software Alliance and Force 11. And these are the members of the steering committee, which are also the co-chairs of the group. We would like also to acknowledge our more than 240 members and all the active participants and people who have joined different events that we had through the year. A bit of housekeeping. Um, you have a link to the collaborative notes in each of the slides. And in the collaborative notes, you will find the slides and also other useful links that will prompt you to the working group, um, the minutes, the events that we had, and the documents that we have um, completed so far. Because this is an RDA plenary, we will abide to the RDA code of conduct. And if you are new to RDA, this is just to emphasize that we want to have a friendly and professional environment that we respect each other and, and we don't differentiate from level of expertise where you're coming from or, or the questions that you have, you are welcome to ask them at, um, at any time. Um, how we are going to run this session is that um, I'm going to be speaking, so please I'll ask you to mute your microphone, and if you have questions, please raise your hand, and, and we will take questions during the middle of the session, so if you can wait until that part, that will be better, but also if you have questions that you really need to ask, please put them in the collaborative notes so we can go there and answer them, even if it's asynchronously. The, the collaborative notes will remain open for you to, to view after this session. Um, and then also remember that this session is being recorded and that it will be made publicly available via this platform for the attendees, but also via the RDA YouTube channel. Um, after the housekeeping, um, I'll continue with the welcome and introductions, also giving you a bit of time to go into the collaborative notes. Um, and remember the, the link to the slides and collaborative notes are also in each of the slides. Um, I'd like to thank you uh, for being here and, and remind you what why we are here and what are the goals of this session. So the working group is uh, towards finalizing the, um, the tasks. And so we want to present to you the fair principles for research software in the current state. We also like to get some feedback on how to apply the fair principles for research software. So coming from different stakeholders, and this is an opportunity for you to share your ideas and your challenges as well. And towards the end of the session, we will showcase some adoption examples and 
what is the reminding task for the group and what we expect uh, towards the, the end of the group and the future. Um, now that we have our people, um, I should introduce myself again. My name is Paula Andrea Martinez. I am one of the co-chairs of the working group and together with Michelle Barker today, we are going to be your facilitators for this session. And this is the agenda for today. So we have roughly 30 minutes to introduce you to what we've been working so far, what are the current um, fair principles for research software. Then we, we have some questions prepared for you to engage in conversation, but you're also welcome to ask any of your questions. And the third part is the subgroup report of early adopters and the road ahead. This is a repeat session from that we had uh, a day and a half ago. And so we have the same collaborative document and just please be mindful to, to see that you are in the correct section. Breakout six is today's session and it should be all at the top. But if you scroll down, you will see what happened in the previous session. So now I'll give you another two minutes for the people who just arrived to take the time to add yourselves to the participant list and I'll review the icebreaker answers. So we have people joining us from the US, from Australia, from France, and from Sweden. Yeah, we'll have less people from Europe because it's really late. And I also put in the icebreaker a little uh, light bar and many of you are joining us almost at midnight. Thanks for being here. The other question that we had was, uh, how's the weather where you're joining us from? Um, a lot of people are happy with the weather they have. <laughs> a nice conversation there. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed the little light bar so you can see that we are across the world and people are joining from different places, which means this is a session valuable for you. Thanks for being here again. Okay. Um, now I'm going to start describing the work of the group. And the work that we've been doing comes with a really um, a motivation of, of a gap that we have identified. So, and this gap is that software is not just another type of data. Since the FAIR guiding principles were published in 2016 by Wilkinson et al, um, they were intended to be applied to all digital objects. However, we found that there's some specific difference that we need to address and the working group is focusing on the adaptation and adoption of the FAIR guiding principles uh, to the specific case of research software. There are two documents that we usually cite for this motivation. Um, one of them is the EOS Task Force Fair Practice um, that in states in recommendation number five that we recognize that fair guidelines will require translation for other digital objects and support such efforts. So this working group is trying to uh, do this translation and adaptation as well. In 2019, the, the French National Committee for Open Science and Free Software and Open Source Project Group um, also released an opportunity note. And one of their recommendations says states that we have to make sure um, the specific nature of software is recognized and not considered just data, particularly in the context of discussion about the notion of fair data. This is some of the motivations of why uh, the the members of the group wanted to start this uh, this challenge. And now for the people who 
have joined us and are new to the group, we always have a little bit of history of what happened. It's, it's, it's good to know where we are at and what has happened before. So like I said before, but if you just join, we are a combined effort between three global organizations, between the RDA, the Research for Alliance, Force 11, and the Research Software Alliance. These three uh, uh, communities that bring together expertise and, and, and help solve challenges, specifically um, social related or technically related. And, and that's why we sign up for this together. And now we, we are a growing community. What the group does is coordinating a range of existing community-led discussions. So this is uh, this hasn't started when the group started. It, it has been carried on for many years before, and, and you can see the history of software by RDA or other groups. Um, and so far, since the beginning of the of the group, since we've been endorsed by RDA in September 2020, we had more than 60 community events and community discussions and community consultations, which is the, the major driver for this group. And we didn't want to, to come up with a definition by a, a small group of people. We really wanted to include your comments and your feedback. And that's what we've been doing for the last year. So I wanted to highlight the two milestones for the group. So first we defined and effectively applied the first principles for research so far, and that's what we have so far. And now towards the end, because we are completing our work um, by March, 2022, we are working on uh, finding um, existing guidelines, prompting people to adopt the fair principles and, and having them share the even their commitment in the future to apply the fair principles for research software. And um, if you are new to the group and you haven't seen it yet, we, we have um, space in RDA where we have all our documentation. And one of those documents that I recommend is the case statement where you can see the details and which other groups we also relate to. Now, a bit of an overview of the bigger picture. Um, to apply the fair principles, uh, we, we have to imagine the bigger ecosystem that software is not just uh, a different digital object and it's independent of everything else. It actually depends on many other things, depends on, on, on the creators, depends on the users, depends on the services and the repositories. And also there's an interdependence of software is created for services and repositories. And this also um, brings us to, to define software as different in, in the application that it has. For example, it could be a tool. Software can also be um, the result of a scientific process, and it also can be the object of study. And that is depending on the circumstances, and we consider this in the first principles research software. Another outcome of the group is the, the definition and also the difference between what is research software versus software in research. Um, this was a question that um, the people have worked towards uh, this definition. So at the beginning of the group, we separated into smaller task forces and subgroups, we call them, to, to look for literature review, to see what's the state, to collect a lot of data. And one of those subgroups was, uh, was targeting um, the definition of research software. And it was a, a challenging output. And this is currently in draft form, but you can find the document and the report linked from our landing page via RDA. And I'm gonna read this for you, um, just to, to have in mind why we're talking about when we refer to, what are we talking about when we refer to research software? So it includes software code files, algorithms, scripts, computational workflows and executables. And the key point is that they were created during the research process or for a research purpose. 
And the definition also highlights that all the software components that were used in research but were not created during or with a clear research intent should not be considered uh, research software. And this differentiation may vary between disciplines. Um, another point to highlight in the definition is that um, the, the intent of research software should be um, computational reproducibility and, and help in the scholarly um, sharing of um, all the digital objects such as research software. So they, we, we want to, to put research software in a higher value state that it currently is and similar to papers and other digital objects. Now I'm, I'm going to go through the, the fair principles for research software in the current state. Um, and I want to give you a bit of the context and, and not just read the, the principles as they are now. Um, by, I'm going to summarize what has happened to, to this point and, and then um, I'm going to prompt you, um, um, what do you think about the fair principles and when it should be applied and who should apply it? And after that, I'm gonna hand over to Michelle for discussion and, and then the, the road ahead. This is what we're gonna do in the comment. Four slides, or no, three slides for consideration and four slides for the principles. Okay. Uh, first, for the development of the fair for its principles, um, we base ourselves in and, and also follow the intent and the methods of the fair guiding principles. And uh, that was our starting point. Um, why is that? Because what the fair guiding principles want to do is maximize and add the value gain by the contemporary form of scholarly digital publishing. And we wanted to include this digital output research software as valuable as any other digital output and adopt towards its significant uh, differences. And why the fair guiding principles exist is to ensure transparency, reproducibility, and specifically reusability. And that's what we also have in, in our ethos for, for these fair principles for research software. Another um, consideration is that the fair principles are aspirational, so it's it's something that can progress and can improve, and it's by no means a binary outcome. It's, it's not either software or um, it's not fair or 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 it's completely fair. It's something that we want people to to self reflect and try to improve. Then another um, point that we have into the many discussions was that software encompasses many forms, as I said it before, it can be a tool, or, uh, the, the research object, or it can be the result of a, a scientific study. And it benefits different uses. For example, um, if you are a research software engineer or a software developer, you might find that it's more useful to have the source code for reusability. But if you are a researcher, you might not want to know how many lines of code this software has. You just want to have the executable in order to use it. So having this consideration in mind, we also um, focus on source code as being often the most useful form to understand software and the easiest form to apply the fair for IS principles. Um, then another point to highlight here is that there are many existing software engineering practices that are relevant to the fair for IS principles, that, but we haven't included them there. For example, modularity or abstraction, documentation, um, or design patterns, those are things that people should be aware of. And um, they are important in producing high quality software, but we put them as complementary and not part of the principles. Um, then I want to go through a bit of more detail into the considerations that we had. Um, the first part was just the, the overview on, on some of the decisions that we took. Um, the challenges of giving guiding principles without giving guidance 
in certain situations. Um, so we noticed from the many consultations that we had that the community was looking for a checklist for a guy that tells them you should do this and this and this and then you'll be fair. But that is different from the, the goal that we had as a group. That's not the principles in itself. We are defining the principles and, and how to apply them is the next step after that. We also consider uh, to some difficulties in the jargon that was used and we try to to, to have less jargon as possible and to make the principles understandable to a broader audience. Uh, another recent change that we had uh, from the principles that were published by our RDA and the outcomes is that we are removing now the modal language towards the aspirational uh, description. So instead of using you should do this or you must do this, uh, we are thinking uh, if software has or is uh, identified by a persistent identifier, that's the aspiration that we have uh, and we want people to, to follow that, um, that principle. Now, I'm, I'm just getting to the point now, but still a little bit more history. During this year, uh, I want you to be aware that we had uh, many, many different consultations. We started in February, uh, in, between February and March with the first uh, community consultation. So that was sent to the working group members and anyone in RDA who is, um, had access to the document, I could read it and could provide some feedback. That was um, to collect all the subgroup works that we have been um, carrying on since last year and try to, to put together all that information between new information and comparison between the principles that were published before, between the fair guiding principles, between existing guidelines that people have for research software, and all of that came up in one document. In April, we had a series of sprints with the writing group, just in preparation for the previous plenary. And in May, we have our second consultation. Um, and we had also a lot of feedback from people going from little details to very challenging questions and also the, the sort of considerations that I mentioned before. During June, we had our steering committee review. And in the middle of this year, it was our milestone to put forward our outcome. And that was shared by the RDA, the Research Software Alliance and Force 11. We had a broader community review. So everyone was invited to review and we have um, seen new eyes in, in this uh, document and a lot of very interesting feedback from the public that we, which we are still working on. And, we, what we are doing since the time the consultation has closed, we are preparing an, the new outcome for RDA. So in response to those documents, you can see this via the DOI that is cited here. And you can see the public document, uh, the public comments as well. And we are also preparing the publication uh, um, for submission. And just to highlight, we, we have added all the working group members as, as one of the authors, because we really appreciate the time and effort that a lot of people have put into reviewing and, and feedback in, into the many series of versions that we had. We call them better versions and what we, we're gonna have now is kind of the first version. Now going to, to the principles, um, I'm gonna go a bit uh, quickly through the, to the um, principles, but I encourage you to read the, the document that I just cited and, and see how a little bit of the, the wording has changed from that document to now with the considerations that I mentioned, mostly the aspiration or focus of the fair principles. And I'm gonna mention a bit of the, um, the comparison between the fair guiding principles, what is new to to the research software principles and what other things we added to the principles as well. So we find the book, the main aim is to, to extend the, the F1 
the, so it, the F1 is the same, assigned a globally unique and persisting identifier, but we wanted ways to assign this identifier to the specific components of software. So, uh, and representing different levels, because we acknowledge that software has components that need to be identified separately. And one of those components is the version. And Specifically in research software, bashing is something that uh, the users need to find, and that's why this principle is highlighted, because it will aid in the findability. And the next three are as before, and we we want metadata to be rich, we want metadata to, to be describing the software, and to be searchable and indexable as well. Accessible is one of the principles that is most similar to the fair guiding principles. It follows the, the, the same wording more or less. We change data for software. Um, but one of the things that we added here is also the A1, that software and its metadata is retrievable by standard protocols uh, in, in the data. In, doesn't have that word. And what we mean by standard protocols is that there are already current protocols that the community uses to share software, for example, HTTPS or FTP or SPT. And, and we want to encourage those. And those protocols should be free and universally implementable. And they, they allow for authentication and authorization whenever it's necessary. And we also want the metadata to be accessible, even if the software is no longer available. So that also targets a little bit of the persistence of the software and for how long a software should be available. That is a question for the community. Interoperable, that is probably one of the principles that, um, that has been significantly rethought, I would say. Um, for software, the focus on in, on interoperability is how information is exchanged. And here we, we cite data or metadata through the interaction of application programming interfaces that are described through standards. And, and we recognize that different domains will have different standards and, and we encourage them to, to, to make them available to the community for others to follow. And in interoperable, uh, we have software reads, writes, and exchange data in a way that means domain community relevant, com domain relevant community standards. And what we added here also is that software includes qualified reference to other objects because software doesn't work by itself. It needs uh, all the software, it needs uh, software in uh, research, um, it also needs data, it also might need services and other things, and, and we want these connections to be clearly identified. And the last one is uh, reusability. Finally, when we get to the point, we um, I also like to mention that um, reusability is linked to accessibility. In software engineering, well, what accessibility means is that the end goal is for this software to be usable by others. And, and that's the focus that we wanted to have here. Um, so we divided this reusability concept into two. Uh, one is usable and that it can be executed. And the other one is that it, it is reusable so it can be understood, modified, built upon and incorporated into other software. So the extensibility of this software is enabled. And, and software is described with a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes. Um, for example, a, a clear uh, accessible license that allows people the terms and conditions of when they can use and reuse. Um, associated with detailed provenance and, and we know that if we don't know how this software works, it doesn't matter if we have all the code. Um, so we, we need to know what's the input, what's the output, what are the, the components and what it needs to work. Um, and then 
again, reinforcing these two points is that SOFA meets community relevant community standards, and that includes references to all the software. And so not just the components, but all the pieces of software that might relate to this. Okay, I have described the five principles in the current form now, and this is one slide that was presented just last month. Like I said, we have many different events for different communities. And during the last event, people were asked, um, so now that you know about the, the fair principles for research software, should we make research software fair? Uh, and there was a, a line of, of questions whether you, yes, we should make all software fair or no, we should not make all software fair in the middle. And most people targeted towards the middle and said it depends. It depends on the context. And I think there's a really take, good takeaway from that discussion. And, and what, what is that word depends, depends on what? And I wanted to show you this slide here that was adapted by Neil Chihon from the Strategy for Culture Change um, and Center of Open Science. And there are many things that will help the application of the FAIR principles uh, to, be, uh, and, and to be more normalized. So if I start from here, training tools, um, we keep talking about this because the more people hear about it, the more normal it becomes and they, then they start learning about what kind of tools they can use, where can they find all the software, uh, where can they find licenses, who they can ask questions to. And then it, it becomes a bit more normalized in communities and that's why we appreciate everyone who is being part of the group and represented their own community. We, we're not here just as individuals. We also represent the community that we work on and it's been really valuable for us. And then the incentives. So at the beginning, there wasn't that many incentives, but now we're starting to see a bit more of the incentives. People want recognition for the effort that they are putting. So they themselves decide that they want to share their code via different code repositories or registries that are specific for their domain. They are adding it more to, to the publications and they're also sometimes uh, publishing research software. And, and, and that's also part of the policy. So some of the journals already have policy that encourages sharing of digital objects, particularly for data, but I've seen many of them that are including data and software because both are necessary to, to be complementary to the results that a publication is showing. And, and overall, the infrastructure that makes it possible. So we, we don't want just a monopoly of one registry that provides DOIs and then everyone uses it. We want um, to have alternatives. We want different communities to come up with infrastructure that helps their own community. And, and so it's that the FAIR principles are relevant to this ecosystem and going back to the a fair ecosystem uh, and seeing all this relationship. So in infrastructure, we, we would like repositories and registries to think about software as in a different category and not just a data collection, for example. So some provocative thoughts there and it's time for me to listen to you now. We invite you to to raise your hand if you have any comments or questions, and uh, we're happy to answer them. I also write your questions in the notes. There's been some interesting discussion going on in the chat about uh, how we identify whether a script is research software or software in research. Uh, as discussion so far has uh, decided that uh, perhaps there are characteristics um, of this of the of its role in the research is more important than the characteristics of the script itself. So yeah, good questions there, a good discussion. Is there anyone in the group who has participated from any of the consultations? Uh, was, was the history useful to you? Um, we have a raised hand from Andrew. Hi. Um, 
If I can ask a question about the accessible definition, and I confess that uh, although I'm responsible for the group that's leading the software activity within the ARDC, I've engaged somewhat late with the FAIR principles for research software. So hopefully I'll not embarrass my staff with this question. Um, so the accessible definition for software sounded like it assumed that you were moving a chunk of source code or a compiled binary. You are accessing um, a piece of software and moving it from where it was currently stored to somewhere where you were planning on using it. And yet it seems to me that increasingly research software is not used in that sense. It's accessed, but it's accessed in situ. It's accessed on a on a virtual machine somewhere on the other side of the world. It's accessed via a, a, a set of services deployed on the cloud. I was wondering whether the definition was going to be expanded or clarified to include that kind of access as opposed to the classic data style, I want to move a set of ones and zeros from here to here kind of access. Thanks for your question, Andrew. Um, Dan has a hand. Would you like to reply? Dan is also a co-chair. Sure, um, if that's okay. Um, yeah, I, I think so, Andrew, in the, actually in the discussion that we had in the previous um, session of this, uh, of this working group um, yesterday morning, I think, um, we talked a lot about services and the fact that a service is really an instantiation of software and is not the, the software itself. And I, I kind of want to give the same answer to you in this case, that, that the thing that we're interested in is, is the software itself, wherever it is, um, as opposed to the, you know, the, the service that provides it or the way that it's provided in some sense. Um, because- or, or the service that the software provides? Not the service that the software provides, but uh, a service that's providing the software functionality. Yeah, yeah, okay. So that that distinction makes sense to me. But the the difference between I want to access a function or a service provided by some software that lives on the other side of the world versus I want to download that lump of source code and compile it and run it myself. That seems to me to be a distinction that will become increasingly irrelevant over time. Uh, sorry, increasingly irrelevant? Irrelevant, yeah. Um, okay, that's interesting. I, I don't, I guess I'm not sure that I would say that directly. And I, I think maybe the balance will shift that, right, that, that more of the software will be in the form of services as opposed to in the form of source code. But it's, I think the problem is that if you start to talk about services, you start to open up lots of questions that we don't have answers to. Oh and yeah, so no, no, to, no, that's that, that's a okay. wriggly can of worms. I agree. So, I, so I think we tried to limit the principles as much as we could to something that where we could answer with the idea that we could that this is version one and these can be extended later. Okay, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. I wanted to add a little bit more on that. Um, so for us, uh, research software to be available in a service, for example, in Galaxy, people still need to find it and, and install it in this service. So the FAIR principle still apply to that resource that will be incorporated into, um, into a service. And, and also one of the things that we, I would like to see personally is that these services that provide access to researchers to specific pieces of research software, they should be able to cite them correctly. And, and if there, there were not principles that tells you you should have a license and an identifier to, to point to the right piece of software, then there will not be an encouragement for the services to provide such information. Do we have another question in the chat? Yeah, there's more discussion in the chat from Romain David on the script issue. Romain, do you want to unmute and discuss it with the group? 
Uh, yeah, j j just to say that uh, there are lots of uh, very wonderful uh, scripts that are used and that are distributed, but uh, if they are not traceable and if we do not know what are the change and the scripts and how they are described and how they are indexed, I think that it's not a software. Software is something sh shared by definition, but it's my opinion. I, I would like to know what are your views about that? Thank you, Roman. Will anyone like to comment on that question? So I, I have to say, I don't, I didn't really understand that question enough to comment on it because maybe, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I, is it possible to, to, um, to rephrase that in a maybe simpler way? I've tried to summarize that in the chat, but uh, you know, there are lots of scripts that are uh, well known, well used, but if they are not well described and uh, uh, the, the, the way to use them are not well described, uh, they, they will not uh, be reused in, in a good way. And I think that it is the difference between a software and a script. But it's my opinion. I, I just want to have your opinion about that. So I, I guess I would say that I agree with you, except I'm not making the distinction between a script and other software in the same way that you are. So I, I think that just as for software to be used, to, to be reused, it has to be well described. Uh, the same goes for a script. But I'm, maybe I'm, I'm, I might not still be understanding correctly. Um, I think you just wants to hear our personal views. Um, I don't think scripts become software when you share them. I think that when you share them, you have to make a bit more effort to make them understandable and I will combine all the parts. So it will combine some documentation, it will combine maybe some test data, and it will also link to other things that this software needs to be run, such as what, how it's needed to be run on. And, and what, what, we, what I had in the, one of the last slides is that fair needs to become fair when the owner wants this to be identifiable. So if you have a thousand of scripts, but you don't really need people to find them, then maybe they don't need to be fair. But what we're trying to achieve, I think, is making science a bit more transparent. So if you publish a paper and you use this many tiny scripts and nobody else can reproduce your research because they don't have access to these tiny scripts, that is, that is the, the, the lacking uh, part of the system because people cannot do it again. But if, if you combine all these little scripts into a pipeline or, or something that is more reusable, then people will be willing to, to use it and then you, you should be encouraged to share that as well. That's my own personal view. There is also ask a question in the chat about software licensing, but a research software with a proprietary license still be considered fair. Uh, so is the relationship between fairness and openness different between recent research software versus data? Oh, so I'm um, sorry, I'll just, I'll jump in for a second and, and just say that what I said in the, in the chat, which is that FAIR doesn't require things to be open either for data or for software, so I don't think it's any different. Yes, the specific kind of license is not defined. As long as you have a license and it has some authorization protocols, then it, it can be FAIR. Okay, so if you don't have any more questions, can we go all to the collaborative documents because we have some questions for you that would like to hear from your feedback, please. Um, 
Michelle, do you think you can share the document? Sure. So if we go to page seven, um, this is good, half and half can describe the pair principles. And for those of you who, who take, you don't have enough information yet, I will really prompt you to go to the working group land page landing page and we have a lot of resources for you from reading materials via um, a Sotero library to the outcomes that the group has come up with. And please add your, your comments if, if you need anything, any specific information we'll be happy to provide. Okay, now let's um, put ourselves in the second question that says, what do you need to encourage adoption of the fair principles in your environment? And this is really important for us to complete our, um, our last milestone, which is uh, the adoption of the fair principles. We want to, to hear from you at this point, what is uh, helping you achieve the adoption and what is hindering you to achieve the adoption? And if anyone has any other incentives, I would really would like to find out as well. Even if it's just an idea, if it's not a, a project in itself yet, what will incentivize you and others to share and to, to make software fair? I, I suppose. Yeah, please, Francois. Uh, the, the, I think that we have seen uh, the fact that we have organized a workshop at the national level, thanks to Moran in June, was really uh, a good thing, I think, also, because they were exposed to the to the work which has which was still being done and to the version of the principles which was uh, in request for comment at RDA at that time. So I think that we could redo the same thing uh, with a focus on the adoption, on adoption and to gather the feeling of uh, a number, probably a, a number of people about uh, the difficulties they can expect, uh, whether they think they will adopt somehow and so on and so forth. So if you are interested and if Moran agrees to do it, I, I think we could try to do that in the coming months before the, the, wor the working group closes and at the proper time for you to take uh, the results into account. So, and I would like to insist for the colleagues who are here on the fact that uh, having this kind of workshop at the national level was really, really useful, I think. And uh, I think it was good also because it, people were engaged to provide comments on something which was in request for comments. Thank you, Francois. That was actually one of the request from the previous session in this plenary that we should uh, organize the workshop. So that's actually the next question. If, you've, uh, if you guys have time to respond to this one, the next question is, uh, what would you expect from a fair for is workshop? And this will really help us in the planning. So Francois and others, if you think a national workshop, it's better 
to to coordinate uh, if yeah, it's focused yeah, on yeah. adoption. In He's our right. case, uh, the interest of having a national workshop is that it's in French. So people have, uh, it's easier for people to, to participate fully. And uh, maybe it brings people who, could, who would not participate in the workshop in English. What we can do eventually is to open it if it's uh, publicized at uh, the RDA level, we can find uh, we can try to open it to people who, who are from other countries and would like to follow something in French. So to, to make it, for instance, at two or three o'clock p.m. in Europe to be able to have uh, the Canadians and also if there are people from Africa, the, the time, time zone is, uh, is okay. And so we can eventually do something like this and, uh, and, uh, and open uh, and uh, pub uh, use the RDA channel to publicize it uh, to, to other people, and also using the Canadian specific French channels to publicize the information in Canada. Thank you, Francois. Yes, please add all of that. I tried to add some in the, in the yes, table. Can, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Any I, others? I will complete. Thank you very much. Um, I want to go through the other answers. Um, what do you need to encourage adoption? Uh, here it says it a simple reference form of the principles to point to. And, and this is something that we will um, get to when we finish the publication. Um, but as you see, it's, it's well done progress and we just need to, to make it. Uh, accessible for all this. Communicate the vision of the change being sought. Um, I think this point of communication is something that we do on an ongoing basis because we've presented at different conferences from, from general topics of interest in technology to very specific domain, specific conferences. And, and we communicate what's the vision, what's the change that we want to see. Um, indication of the bread of adoption, you will hear now uh, the stories. And I'm just getting aware of time. <laughs> okay, does anyone have the hand up? We can go to the next part. Um, please take your time to fill the last question. Uh, and now we can go towards the end of the session. Fantastic. I'll share the last half an hour when my computer catches up with me. Uh, is that right? So thank you for Paula for having uh, talked us through uh, so much of the history and current activities and uh, chaired all of that discussion uh, to get some feedback that we will utilize going forward. Um, as Paula explained, we're getting towards the end of our 18 month tenure. We finish in March and we're at the stage now of really thinking about uh, some of the questions that we've just been discussing. Uh, what adoption guidelines already exist? Uh, how could we um, help uh, catalyze the development of more? Uh, how, how do we uh, get um, early adopter stories out there, et cetera? So we formed three new subgroups uh, about a month ago, um, subgroup five, six, and seven, because we'd had four subgroups uh, about a year ago as well. Uh, so I'll just talk through the work of these three subgroups, uh, which uh, uh, aim to finish their work by December. So subgroup five is focused on adoption guidelines uh, and led by Paula, Sandra Gasing, uh, Leila Jal Castro and Chris Erdman. Uh, and their aim is to identify existing fair research software guidelines and tools uh, that we could share in the kinds of workshops that we've just been discussing. Uh, make more easily accessible online, uh, promote to everybody who's really keen on implementing the principles. So that group's already identified 34 existing pieces, uh, not that cover fair for research software in their entirety, entirety uh, but uh, you know, pick up on different pieces or apply them in different disciplines or national contexts or to solve particular problems. 
uh, and are thinking about how, uh, how to categorize those to make it easy to find guidelines that are particularly useful to their situation and also to think if there's any gaps uh, where there's resources that aren't in existed yet, that there's parts of the uh, principles that really aren't explained by any existing guidelines. Subgroup six is led by Dan Katz and Carlos Martinez Ortiz. Uh, it's aiming to identify and start work with software projects, organizations, funders, publishers, anyone on uh, to identify examples of how fair for research software principles are being adopted. Uh, so they've identified um, a number of potential adopters. Some of them have self-identified and we're now uh, starting to see where we can write up some of those stories and really record what people are doing uh, as an evidence bank for people who are thinking about how to apply the principles in their own context, be an institution or national or a funder or a, or a publisher, uh, to provide them with some case studies that they could learn from or things that they could reuse in their own environment. And the last subgroup, subgroup seven, uh, led by Tom Honeyman and Kian Zeng, uh, is looking at how we could clarify the governance mechanisms for the principles going forward. So one of the things we're conscious of is the FAIR guiding principles that was published in 2016 haven't had a process to think about how they could be updated and changed. And so we've been thinking, is that something we should build into our uh, process now early on? Uh, that as the kinds of questions that have been raised today I continue to be raised as people apply the principles and say, what did this bit really mean? Or this doesn't work in that context. Uh, would there be a stage at which we might want to revise them? Uh, so this subgroup seven is asking questions about how a governance mechanism could work. What would it do? Uh, how could it increase the confidence in uptake uh, and provide mechanisms for raising concerns, etc.? It's not trying to become the group that governs FAIR principles, uh, the FAIR for RS principles, sorry. It's just starting to think about um, what that could look like and if it's beneficial to go down that, that pathway. We've already got some of the early adopter stories filmed for you today. Uh, so you can see some examples of how a range of different organizations are already implementing or thinking about, and to some extent implementing the affair for research software principles. So I'm just gonna play those videos for you now. Oh, sorry, I'll just explain. The videos are uh, from Australian Research Data Commons, uh, the Netherlands Youth Science Center and the German Aerospace Center. Uh, so if your organization's not already um, part of the subgroup discussion identifying early adopters and uh, you think you could be an early adopter or definitely are, then uh, we'd love to hear from you as well. Michelle, I can't hear the audio. Um, there, there should be a share know. audio option. Yeah, so you'll, you'll have to stop sharing your screen and then reshare that window and click the button in the bottom left when you do the share before you pick the window you're going to share. Say that again, Dan. I've stopped sharing and now okay, click, I... Click on the share button and a little menu pops up with all the things you could share. And on the bottom left of that, there's a little checkbox to share audio that you need. Oh, to... okay. Yeah, got it. To where I need to be. I pressed the wrong my computer always runs a bit slow when I'm running Zoom, so it'll just catch up in a sec.
Almost there. My name is Tom Hun My name is Tom Honeyman and I'm the software program manager at the Australian Research Data Commons. In that program we have a number of activities working towards recognition of research software as a first class output of research. The Australian Research Data Commons is part of our federally funded national research infrastructure landscape. Our purpose is to provide Australian researchers with a competitive advantage through data. And our mission is to accelerate research and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis and retention of high quality data assets. We have a great many activities spread across our themes of coordination and coherence, data and services, platforms and software, and storage and compute. A cross cutting theme over the top of all of these areas is FAIR. And to date, our primary focus has been on making data and metadata FAIR. But we are only too happy to adopt the FAIR for RS principles to help guide how we and our project partners can make research software more fair over time. We'll be doing this across three areas. We have policy laying out expectations for making fair the outputs arising from co-investment. So we'll be updating our existing policy on fair to reference the fair for RS principles when specifically considering research software. Many Australian organizations look to us for assistance when applying the fair principles. So we'll be looking to update and create guidance materials and activities to assist with the uptake of the fair for RS principles by partner organizations. Finally, although we ourselves are not a major producer of research software, we'll be looking to apply the principles to our own software assets to demonstrate what the impact of adopting the principles can mean. Thank you, Tom. And it's very exciting to have these early adopter stories already. It's a great uh, testament to our success in engaging the community that even as the uh, principles are, uh, this draft of the principles are being finalised, we've already got people committed to using them. Hello, everyone. My name is Rob van Newbord, and I am the Director of Technology at the Netherlands e Science and as the Director of Technology, I'm responsible for the technology strategy uh, and also for knowledge development and software sustainability. And last but not least, I'm responsible for recruiting of our research software engineers, or RSEs, who are actually our most important asset. Now, the eScience Center is the Dutch National Expertise Center for Research Software. And what we do is we fund collaborative projects together with researchers in all disciplines. And if you think about it, today, research in any discipline is basically impossible without software. And I think from climate change to sustainable cities to astrophysical simulations, they all depend on software. And that's where we come. So we offer our expertise in the form of those research software engineers. And we jointly, together with the researchers, develop this powerful software that helps them with their data management issues, data analysis, uh, designing models, efficient computing, and machine learning. So it's very broad in terms of technology. Now, at the same time, another important activity is that we train researchers in research software development and on how to do that in a sustainable way. So our mission is to make software as broadly reusable as possible, uh, even across discipline boundaries. So we believe in the Fair for Research Software principles as a very good starting point for making software reusable in the long term. Now, in our projects, we uh, promote the reuse of software. And in fact, we already use these principles in practice every day. So to support this important cause, the eScience Center intends to adopt the FAIR, research, FAIR for Research Software principles by basically doing three things. 
The first is that we uh, are using the fair for research software principles to support the creation of reusable software as a part of all our projects and all the proposals that we grant as a funding organization. Secondly, we want to contribute by um, basically training researchers and developing the skills necessary to implement the principles in practice. Um, we do that in, in terms of a training program, but also by the development of very practical guidelines to help researchers further. So not only the partners that we work with, but also in a broader context, we share these principles. And last but not least, we want to support this community uh, by continuing to promote the principles at the policy level, right? We want to put it on the policy agendas, both at the national and the international level. So we really look forward to the further adoption of these principles. It's an important goal for the science sector. So thank you for your attention. It's great to see the variety of ways in which adoption can be achieved. Oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, as stated there, it could be uh, that it, um, changes are made at a policy level, a uh, funder could make requirements uh, in the way that they uh, require grantees to work with software or produce software outputs, or it also could also be a commitment uh, to training, uh, providing uh, skills, um, opportunities to upskill or resources for the community on, on how to apply the principles. My name is Karina Haupt and I work for the German Aerospace Center, also called DLR, and I'm there the head of the Sustainable Software Engineering Group. Um, DLR focuses on a broad range of domains uh, from aeronautics to space to energy to transportation, um, digitalization and safety. And in total, we have more than 9000 employees. Um, for most of these employees, software it plays an important role either in using it or in developing it. And obviously a focus there with, is with research software. Um, since this is not a new development, um, DLR already started quite some activities in the field of um, increasing the quality of the software which we develop. So we started, for example, the Software Engineering Initiative um, of DLR, of which, for example, the development of software engineering guidelines was a big part. And while we already target quite some aspects like sustainability in these guidelines, um, we don't focus on fair software principles. And so we want to change this. So one of the activities we want to include fair princip software principles within DLR is um, to adapt its guidelines, to extend them so that we cover all the important aspects. Another activity we want to do together with Helmholtz, um, the Helmholtz Association, where DLR is a part of, and this is to uh, start a research software directory where we make um, the software from DLR, but also from all of Helmholtz uh, findable. And we already are in the process of doing our first step by showing off uh, like the lighthouse projects, um, which are already existing in all the different Helmholtz centers. And yeah. Hopefully soon you will have a look and be able to find more and more of our software. Thanks. Thank you there for our three talks from uh, the German Aerospace Center, uh, the Netherlands eScience Center and the Australian Research Data Commons. And I guess if you're thinking about your own context and how uh, your own uh, environment could increase adoption of the fair for RS principles, it's worth beginning by reflecting on the extent to which you already do support some of them. Uh, most people already do uh, at least some of the practices uh, in, their, in, in their daily day, in their day to day processes. Uh, so an easy next step can be think about uh, particular steps you could take uh, moving forward to adopt a bit more of one of the principles or to uh, work more on one of the others that you don't address it to a great deal yet. Now, just to uh, conclude, I'll talk a little bit about the next steps uh, for the working group uh, as we um, move towards completion. Sorry, that's not exactly what I'll talk about. I'll talk about some of the uh, peripheral uh, things that this conversation around fair for research software principles has, has spawned. Um, uh, so whilst we're all aware that having uh, fair guidance 
principles applied to research software is a fantastic achievement uh, that we have this version of the principles available for us to adopt and implement uh, is something that the whole community should be proud of internationally. Uh, but to make uh, the implementation of these principles a reality requires a lot more work. We can certainly look at the last five years of the FAIR principles being applied to data to see how many different initiatives have been uh, created uh, to help make that a reality. Uh, so there's been some conversations uh, as an initiative called the FAIR for RS Roadmap uh, that the Research Software Alliance that I'm the director of has been leading to think about how we could expand uh, adoption to a whole range of different areas. Are there other conversations? Are there other working groups or interest groups or, or collaborations that are needed uh, to look at uh, how to apply uh, this in a whole range of different areas? So the first step that we've been trying to do is to map uh, where there's existing projects uh, looking at some of the elements. Uh, what do we know? Uh, where are we at in the conversation of research software metadata or uh, services or certification, uh, interoperability uh, of some of those? Uh, and this has resulted so far in the establishment of a few working groups to look at particular areas. So having the principles uh, now logically could lead into the development of some indicators or metrics associated with them. So there's been a metrics working group started. Uh, there'll probably be some contextualization of the principles as they go into different disciplines. So we have a life science working group that has already begun led by Elixir. And a lot of that work will focus internally uh, for the next 12 months uh, within Elixir and then broaden uh, to um, engage other areas of the life sciences. Uh, here at the RDA plenary, we have the Fair for VREs working group, having their first working group uh, discussion. And their aim is to look at all the different tools that a VRE could, a virtual research environment could use in becoming FAIR, uh, with the FAIR for research software principles being one of those tools. So to think about how to apply uh, those principles in that environment. And we also had a birds of a feather session uh, yesterday here at the RDA plenary uh, to think about how we might need to develop skills and training curriculums to specifically support uh, FAIR for research software. And a lot of that discussion focused on uh, looking at existing skills and training curriculums uh, in the research software space, um, not necessarily yet specifically FAIR, uh, but then looking at some of the FAIR data curriculums and trainings and seeing what we could learn from them. Uh, so the recording of that will become available if you're interested in that area. You can still get involved in our next six months, final six months of work. And, and part of that, uh, we'll be thinking about what comes next when we wrap up the working group. Uh, do we create uh, some other kind of conversation? Is, is it going to be another working group that takes forward some different aspects of this work? Uh, so you can sign up to be on the mailing list to be kept abreast. Uh, and it'll give you information opportunities where you can comment on things or give inputs or attend webinars or I get to the stage of partnering with us to run a workshop or collaborating um, on developing resources, uh, that's the best way to stay informed. You can also follow our steering committee meeting minutes. Uh, there's a meeting every month, uh, next Monday's the next one, uh, or Tuesday morning if you're in Australia. Uh, you can look at some of our resources and other things that we've collected on the Zenodo and the Zotero. And there's one page uh, linked there at the bottom, which just has an overview of all of this. So there's a fantastic range of ways that uh, you can engage. And uh, we, we'd love to have even more people involved in helping make this a reality. Finally, we'd like to thank all the 240 members and 135 participants of our working group. Uh, the nine current steering committee members and past steering committee members uh, who have done a fantastic job in being very active in, in making this uh, such a success. And finally, uh, to our funders, both the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation um, and the Wellcome Trust, and I see David Carr was on the, is, was on the call. Uh, we're very grateful for their support in um, providing uh, some resourcing so that we could achieve so much in the year that we've already been running. Uh, we've had fantastic outcomes in engagement in getting the principles drafted in the timelines that we'd set in, in running uh, at least four events, often workshops or webinars every month uh, to really uh, engage the community and get so many of you excited uh, and contributing to the development and, and now 
uh, really um, focused on how we adopt and implement some of this. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, we do have a few minutes left, so I might just cross back to Paula to see if there's anything else she wanted to pick up on. Yes, uh, we welcome any questions for this last section um, and the, the plans ahead. And if you want to get involved, I also like to remind you to please add your ideas into the workshop uh, question that we had. And if you can, please write some takeaways. So we will share with the working group uh, members um, the summary of this session. So the way that we communicate is through the working group mailing list. If you are not uh, there yet, you are welcome to join. All right, are we done then, Paula? Yeah, just giving a minute if anyone is shy to raise their hand for asking questions. You can also type your questions in the document and I, I commit to reply later on. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, all the information is publicly available. Even if you are not part of the group, you can have a look in our group and the posts, events, uh, everything is open for your perusal. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye.